playing with probability or how to win big in science, y'all. So you remember this graphic? And I said that you are in strict CDA when you have a very specific hypothesis. You know exactly how you're going to test it. You know exactly how you're gonna manipulate the data. You know exactly which measures you're gonna use. You know everything. If you're doing null hypothesis significance testing or classical statistics, guess what? The statistics you use are assuming you are in strict CDA territory. Or if you'll remember, strict confirmatory data analysis. As opposed to where most researchers find themselves where they have a hypothesis, but they don't know all those decisions yet. And I mentioned back in the day that if you are doing strict CDA, there are strict rules associated with it, y'all. And I'm about to explain these rules, by the way. So let me do a demonstration, shall we? Let's say I claim I have the power of telekinesis. I can bend the movement of dice to my will. To prove it, I'm gonna show you. I'm about to get two sixes by bending the dice to my will. Now, what's the probability that I will have that happen just by chance alone? One six times one six or three percent. Very close to a five percent probability, by the way. So if I actually did that, roll the dice and got two sixes, you'd be impressed, wouldn't you? Well, let's see what happens. Boom! Except... Now, are you impressed? Uh-uh. Because it's only impressive if I try it once and I get it on the first try. Right? So let's turn back to our marriage example. Let's assume Jill's therapy does not work, which is what we do when we're doing significance testing anyway. It would be odd to find an extreme mean difference if the treatment didn't actually work. Let's say that Jill rolled the dice multiple times. With and without outliers, with one measure of relationship satisfaction, and then another, with one covariate adjustment, like age, then another, Gender, then another. Socioeconomic status. At the end of the day, how many dice has Jill rolled? Seven. With and without outliers, two measures of the dependent variable, three different covariates. Seven times. What's her probability of getting a significant result now? Uh-oh. So at the end of the day, when Jill has rolled the dice multiple times, something is gonna happen just by chance alone, not because it's actually there. So what's the point? Every time you analyze data, you're gonna roll the dice. Without strict rules in place, there's a strong possibility that you're going to inflate your chances of getting a rare event. Let's talk about what those strict rules are. Rule number one, you can only compute one p-value, unless you make some sort of adjustment like a bon Veroni correction. If you compute more than one probability, guess what? It's like rolling the dice multiple times. And thus you are inflating your chances of getting significant results. But researchers routinely roll the dice more than once. Testing multiple hypotheses, is anxiety correlated with depression? Oh. Is height correlated with depression? Oh. Is ice cream consumption correlated with depression? There it is. We audition multiple dependent variables. Depression measured with BDI? Oh man. Depression measured with SCID? Well darn. Oh, depression measured by CESD? Got it. Number three, we audition multiple covariates. Let's control for age? Well darn. Let's control for gender? Hmm, no luck. Let's control for socioeconomic status? Oh, darn. Ooh, let's control for middle finger circumference? <gasps> Got it! Or here's one that nobody seems to talk about. You see the problem here? In multiple regression, every single variable we put in is gonna come with a p-value. Every parameter you estimate has a significance test. Is that rolling the dice multiple times? <laughs> yeah! That's rule number one. You can only roll the dice once unless you're doing some sort of adjustments for multiple comparisons. Rule number two, the assumptions must be met. You remember when we talked about diagnostics, we talked about linearity, homoscedasticity, normality, etc., etc., etc. Well, guess what? If we don't meet these assumptions, we run the risk of committing a type one error or a type two error. Oh, and by the way, nobody ever checks the viability of their assumptions. If you want to learn more about this topic, be sure to visit my diagnostics video linked in the description. Rule number three, you must specify your sample size in advance. Um, really? Um, yeah. Um, why? Good question. It's because of this. See the link in the description. What this paper argues is the p-value is a function of the sample size because the central limit theorem tells us the probability of obtaining our results given the null with our specific sample size. So if we intend to collect 100 participants or 500 or 400 or 1,000, guess what, people? Every single one of those different choices has a different sampling distribution. So for our study of, let's say, 103 people, 
to match the assumptions of the central limit theorem, guess what? We have to fix our intentions to that specific sample size. So if we don't fix our intended sample size in advance, guess what? We have no idea what the sampling distribution looks like. Because on one time it looks like this, on another time it looks like this, another time it looks like this, it's all over the place. Now ask yourselves, do people actually fix the sample size in their mind before they collect data? Nope. Do you think there are researchers out there that say, well, shoot, I intended to collect exactly 100 participants and I got 103. Guess I'm gonna throw out those three data points. You kidding me? Nobody would do that, yet they should. At least if they're relying on a p-value for any sort of decision making. So those are the basic rules for a p-value to mean anything. A p-value can only be interpreted at face validity if you compute one p-value, you meet all of these statistical assumptions, and you specify your sample size in advance. And how many researchers actually meet these three conditions? None, or at least very rarely. So we probably shouldn't be using p-values to make scientific decisions. But suppose we did actually meet these super strict conditions, then what? You had better not misinterpret that p-value, dude. But the problem is p-values practically invite you to misinterpret them. What is the correct interpretation of the p-value? It is the probability of obtaining these results or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. And assuming these specific conditions like sample size, dependent variable measured, independent variable measured, etc, etc, etc. What a p-value does not mean is the probability your experiment will fail to replicate. Meaning it is not correct to say that you have a 95% probability of finding significant results again. P-values do not mean the probability the alternative is false False, the probability your theory is false, or even the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Wait a minute, didn't you just say that that's what a p-value is? It's the probability the null hypothesis is true? No, I did not, good sir. I said it is the probability of observing our data, or data more extreme than this, if the null is true. Probability of the null is not equal to the probability of the data given the null. That is a p-value. Or the probability of the null given the data is not equal to the probability of data given the null. Because what we want to know is we want to know the equation on the left. We want to know the probability that the null hypothesis is true given what we found in our data. But a p-value won't tell you that. Those are two entirely different probabilities. Think about it this way. The probability of death given that you've been attacked by a shark is not equal to the probability of being attacked by a shark given that you are dead. Guess what? If you are dead, it's probably very unlikely that you were killed by a shark. On the other hand, if you've been attacked by a shark, the probability that you will die isn't all that small. These two quantities are not the same. So at the end of the day, if we want to use a p-value to make any sort of scientific decisions, guess what? We can only compute one p-value. We have to meet all the statistical assumptions and we need to fix our sample size in advance. Then at the end of the day, a p-value doesn't even tell us anything useful. Okay, so what do I do? Excellent question. Because here's the thing, there are lots of alternatives to p-values. Estimation, which means we simply look at the means or standard deviations or correlation coefficients or effect sizes or Cohen's D and confidence intervals. And see the technical side note in the description about confidence intervals. These statistics aren't concerned about whether an effect is present, they're concerned with how large an effect is, which isn't that what we want to know anyway? Second alternative is graphical data analysis. Just look at your data. We don't need a significance test when we see this. We already know something's there. We don't need a p-value. Option number three, Bayesian statistics. Bayesian statistics is intuitive to interpret. You can test the alternative hypothesis directly and it naturally aggregates information across studies. But Bayesian has its own limitations, mostly ease of use, but we hope that'll change in the future. Number four, model comparisons. Kinda, because sometimes model comparisons also rely on a p-value, but they don't have to. Instead of testing whether a slope is exactly zero, instead what we do is we build two competing models. Then we pit them against one another. Survival of the fittest. In short, what is the alternative? This course is the alternative. I'm teaching you estimation. I'm teaching you graphical data analysis. I'm teaching you diet Bayesian. And in the future with some advances in software, I'm gonna teach you non-diet Bayesian. Fat Bayesian? So make sure you like, subscribe, and comment so you don't miss any amazing updates. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, understand how ethics plays a role in sampling theory and null hypothesis significance testing. If in order to get statistical significance, we had to roll the dice multiple times, we need to be honest and transparent about that. And actually, we shouldn't even report a p-value if we did roll the dice multiple times. Number two, understand how p-hacking inflates p-values. 
Again, it's just rolling the dice multiple times. Number three, understand the conditions required for correctly interpreting a p-value. Only one test. We must meet all statistical assumptions. We must fix our sample size before collecting data. Number four, know the relationship between strict confirmatory data analysis and p-values. And strict CDA basically means you have met all these conditions, in which case you can actually interpret a p-value. Otherwise, you cannot. And finally, understand the alternatives to null hypothesis significance testing. Estimation, graphical data analysis, Bayesian statistics, and model comparisons. Though there are others, but these are probably the biggest contenders. And finally, have a great day.